Tonight, one month on, tens of thousands of Bangladeshis gathered to mark a month since the ousting of the former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and the installation of the interim government headed by the Nobel Laureate Yunus. Jabs arrive. Hopes for quelling an MPOX crisis in the DRC grow as vaccines donated by the EU finally landed in the disease-ridden country. Dues for Trump. The race for the White House keeps picking up a pace as both candidates appeal to key voter bases. Donald Trump paints a grim picture for the future of Israel should Harris take the lead. Puppy Power. Man's best friend is put into test in saving lives through emotional support. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Aquil Qureshi. Welcome to World News Tonight, right here on Other There in a 24. Well, we've got key updates to bring to you from around the world. Let's begin in our neighboring country in Bangladesh. Tens of thousands of Bangladeshi gathered to mark one month since former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina resigned and fled the country. People, mostly students, gathered at Dhaka University campus chanting revolutionary slogans and compromising and, of course, uh, comprehending those killed during the week's long violence. Thousands of people rallied Thursday in Bangladesh's capital to mark one month since former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina was ousted in a mass uprising sparked by students of a government job quarters. The central procession, styled as a Shahidi Mart, or procession for martyrs began from Dhaka University campus and marched through the streets. In addition to the many Bangladeshi flags, some participants carried a giant Palestinian flag. The protesters also made a notion to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, as Hasina is known to be a trusted ally of India. Many protesters have condemned India for promoting Hinduism and for sheltering Hasina. Updating you on the Papal Wisit. Pope Francis was wrapped up his first leg of his 12-day Asia-Pacific tour in Indonesia, leaving Jakarta for Port Merze, the capital of Papua New Guinea. The papal and entourage was seen leaving the Vatican Embassy in central Jakarta. The Pope sat in front seat, rolling down the window of a white multi-purpose vehicle car that he had been using since landing in Jakarta. Upon leaving the embassy compound, the papal convoy was halted by a crowd of worshippers hoping to see the Pope for the one last time before he left the country. Pope Francis's car stopped several times throughout its way to the airport, with the Pope greeting and blessing people who formed his car. The pontiff, who made calls for interfaith dialogue to solve world crises, was welcomed by several political and religious officials at the airport and greeted officials, committee members and airport workers before finally embarking the airplane operated by national flag carrier Garuda Indonesia. The pontiff thanked the cardinal and the Indonesian people for their prayers and welcome before leaving the stadium for the Vatican Embassy mansion. The latest on the MPOX outbreak now. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has received its first batch of MPOX vaccines. The health authorities hope that the EU-donated 99,000 doses will help curb an outbreak that is prompted by the United Nations to declare a global public health emergency. A plane carrying the first batch of MPOX vaccines landed in the Democratic Republic of Congo on Thursday. It's the epicenter of an outbreak that prompted the UN to declare a global public health emergency. A European Union official said the first delivery consists of 99,000 doses manufactured by Bavarian Nordic. They were donated by the EU. He said another delivery on Saturday will bring that total to 200,000 doses, with the aim of getting 566,000 of them to wherever needs are greatest in the region. A lack of MPOX vaccines in Africa has hampered efforts to stop the sometimes deadly disease. The delivery in Congo should start to address a huge inequity that left African countries with no access to the two shots used in a 2022 outbreak while they were widely available in Europe and the U.S. Congolese Health Minister Samuel Roger Kamba Malamba says authorities will start planning who will get the vaccine and where 
with the aim of prioritizing what he called hotspots. Congo has said it will launch its vaccination campaign on October 8th. That will give it time to carry out an awareness-raising campaign to overcome mistrust in some communities. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now. Former President Donald Trump told a crowd of Jewish Republicans that if Vice President Kamala Harris wins the president election this fall, Israel would be gone. The former president, who previously criticized Jewish Democrats and said they hate Israel, also added that Jewish voters supporting Harris should have their heads examined, as he said during rallies. Trump has ramped his rhetoric about who Jewish voters should back amid increased fears of anti-Semitism after October 7 attacks in Israel. Since the Gaza war, Trump has claimed that Jewish voters who choose Democrats hate their religion and hate everything about Israel and has called Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish official in America and a staunch defender of Israel, a proud member of Hamas. Speaking via live stream at the group's annual retreat in Las Vegas, Trump also acknowledged the death of the six Israeli hostages. He also repeated his comment that the October 7 attacks on Israel would have never happened if he had been president at the time. Israeli forces appear to have withdrawn from three refugee camps in the occupied West Bank by today morning, after more than week-long military operations that left dozens dead and a trial of destruction. Smashed windows and bullet holes, it's the aftermath of an Israeli raid here in Jenin in the occupied West Bank, where the army launched a wide-scale military operation over a week ago. Vehicles and cranes belonging to an electricity company were also destroyed during the raid. According to the army, the city and adjacent camp are a bastion for Palestinian armed groups. The camp was shut off by troops as part of the Israeli operation, leading some residents too afraid to step outside. Israel's forces frequently make incursions into the West Bank, but this operation marks one of the largest since the second Palestinian Intifada, or uprising, two decades ago. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, since last week, the fighting has killed dozens of Palestinians. Some have been claimed by armed groups as members, but the ministry says several children are also among the dead. Hunter Biden had pleaded guilty to all nine charges in his federal tax evasion case, catching federal prosecutors off guard as they prepared to begin his trial. The son of the U.S. President Joe Biden had previously denied allegations that they intentionally avoided paying $1.4 million in income taxes from 2016 to 2019. Hunter Biden pleaded guilty to federal tax charges on Thursday. It's a surprise move by the son of President Joe Biden that avoids a potentially embarrassing trial weeks before the U.S. presidential election in November. Biden had been set to stand trial in a Los Angeles federal courthouse on criminal charges of failing to pay $1.4 million in taxes while spending lavishly on drugs, sex workers, and luxury items. Instead, he pleaded guilty to all nine counts he faced. He now faces up to 17 years in prison and up to $450,000 in penalties. Earlier in the day, Biden had offered to plead guilty to the charges but avoid admitting wrongdoing, an unusual legal maneuver called an Alford plea. Prosecutors opposed that move. After a break, Biden's lawyer Abe Lowell told the judge that he would plead guilty, despite having no prior agreement with prosecutors that would ease his sentence. In a statement after the hearing, Biden said he pleaded guilty to spare his family from having to sit through a trial that would have aired messy details from a period in his life where he was suffering from drug addiction. He also said that he had paid back his taxes. Lowell told reporters afterward that Biden might appeal his sentence. Biden is currently appealing a guilty verdict in a separate case in Delaware for illegally buying a gun while using drugs. That conviction means he could face a stiffer sentence for the tax case if convicted, because he would be a repeat offender. The White House has said President Biden has ruled out pardoning his son. 
Hunter Biden's sentencing has been set for December 16th. Oh, in France, the veteran French conservative Michael Barnier has taken over as prime minister almost two months after France's snap election ended in a political stalemate. He said France has come to a gracious moment and he is facing it with humility, further adding he said that all political forces must be respected and listened to. Best known internationally as the European Union's Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier is a conservative career politician who has held minister positions in several French governments, including under Jacques Chirac and Nicolas Sarkozy. He was first elected to Parliament in 1978, aged 27, representing the Alpine Savoie district. In 1992, he helped organise the Winter Olympics in his constituency, an event still central to his public image. Barnier is pro-European and has twice worked as an EU commissioner. First as a commissioner for internal market and services, during which he negotiated new regulation of financial markets after the 2008 global crash. Then in 2016, Barnier took the reins in the Brexit negotiations after Britain's referendum on leaving the bloc. Long seen as a moderate, the 73-year-old toughened his discourse during his failed bid to get his Conservative Party's ticket for the 2022 presidential election, saying immigration was out of control. Since then, Barnier has kept a low profile. For Emmanuel Macron, he offers continuity and reassurance that he won't undo his political agenda of the last few years. And finally tonight, an eight-month-year-old comfort dog, Vinny, braces to take on her duties at the New Hampshire 911 call centre. Winnie is joining as a part of the centre's effort to support mental health and wellness. Her training will be among the hero pups and she will assume uh, her special role once she turns one. A new team member is joining the New Hampshire 911 call centre. A comfort dog named Winnie. Abby, Winnie's soon-to-be handler, pitched the idea. We had a group of therapy dogs who were privately owned and volunteers would bring them around just to visit our team. And I saw the immediate impact that these dogs had on everyone. No matter what kind of a week you've been having, no matter what kind of back-to-back -back calls you've been taking, you could take just five, maybe ten minutes and have a little sense of normal in your kind of crazy uh, day. And it, it would just immediately affect the whole mood in the room. You're dealing with everybody's worst day, and that's your every day. So um, I just saw the impact that these therapy dogs had, and I just started thinking, how can we get that just more? And it springboarded into this. They got the eight-month-old puppy from Hero Pups. We start training the dog before we ever even meet the handler. So you have to make sure you have the right dog for the right situation. And Winnie was absolutely the right dog for both Abby and the agency. Like other employees, Winnie will have a set work schedule. She lives with me. She goes on days off with me. Any daily work hours that I do or overtime that I do, she can do that with me. But she has to have her time off too. She has to have her time to just be a dog. Um, that's important for all of our mental health, canines included. New Hampshire 911 has inspired other agencies to consider dogs. Oh, we have, we have a wait list. Winnie will join the team when she turns one. Until then, staff is patiently awaiting her arrival. It's been fantastic. I mean, every time I've got new pictures of Winnie, it's a big deal. The whole office wants to see it. It's just kind of a bright little ray of sunshine into our daily life. I've noticed when somebody takes a bad call, you know, when they are that ear witness to the worst day of someone's life, they get off the call and nine times out of 10, they'll look over at me and say, I wish Winnie was here now, uh, or today's a day that we could really use Winnie. And that tells me it, it was the right choice. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll be back on Monday with Moki stories from around the world. But until then, stay tuned as we've got nightly business report with Anuradha Wickmer Singha. And until then, I'm Akwal Qureshi, and have yourselves a good night.